have to say that uh, I've never seen I've never seen online instruction be so engaging as it was with the teachers uh, from that we had at least for Wyatt because um, they, they made it truly fun. Welcome to Linda Mood Bell Radio. I'm Dave Hungerford for Linda Mood Bell, and that was the voice of Shell Moore, the mother of a child diagnosed with hyperlexia. Now, more than ever, Linda Mood Bell is ready to meet the individual learning needs of families. We have a variety of ways to help your child stay on track no matter what. If your current school is all distance or a hybrid, we can help your student with distance learning assignments either in person or online. If your student has fallen behind after months away from school, we can give them a much needed learning boost in reading or math. And for students who need a personalized school, Linda Mood Bell Academy has part-time, full-time, and even single courses kindergarten through 12th grade. Call us to talk about how we can help your student have a great year. Now here's the conversation with Shell. I'm Shell Moore. Um, I live in Fresno, California, and um, my husband and I have um, three sons, well actually four sons, um, one not by birth, but he, he, we consider him our son, and two older boys. Uh, Wyatt is our youngest. And uh, we're a blended family, so we always just kind of called it just add water. <laughs> so we kind of just blended everything together years ago. Um, Wyatt, um, not necessarily expected on our journey, but Wyatt ended up being diagnosed with autism at a very young age. Um, he was about 19 months old when we got his initial diagnosis. And um, he was pretty much nonverbal until about four and a half years old. Um, he always um he loved letters more than any child i've ever known more than any human in the world ever could i think um before he was talking he could read and um he would act out motions from flashcards when we would play like we had a flashcard that said hands up and he would stick his hands up when we would show him that flashcard we had different ones that we would do to to play I always wanted um, him to learn to read uh, easily through play from the very beginning. So that was something that we tried to nurture. Um, we've got um, lots of videos and memories of him with plastic magnetic letters and uh, blocks that had the alphabet on them. He liked to stack them. And um, initially when he was very, very young, about a little over a year and a half, uh, we discovered that he could recognize all the letters by playing a game on our phone. We would sit together and um, we would name different letters and he would push the button that corresponded with the right letter. So we knew he had letter recognition. And you said he didn't speak until he was four. Right. right Nonverbal until four. Yeah. So it, it was, um, you know, at trying to motivate him to, to speak, you know, he loved playing letter games. So we would do a lot of letter games where we would hold up a letter or block with a letter and he would name that letter. And he loved playing that. And we encouraged it because we were told by all the professionals that the more we can get him to engage and try to speak, then the better. So initially we communicated using a PEX, Picture Exchange Communication, uh, which is like a series of little picture cards uh, that you, you use. So if he wanted a certain show, he could bring us a card of the picture showing, you know, Nemo on it. And we knew he wanted to watch the Nemo movie or, you know, I'm thirsty. So he would bring the drink card. Um, we would also do sign language, you know, for certain things like that. Um, and then as he got closer, I guess, between two and three years old, when we knew that he could read certain words, we started actually using a whiteboard, um, a little compact whiteboard that we could write or he could write, you know, what it was that he desired before he would speak it. Um, we knew that he could not only recognize letters, but was also starting to read because he would spell words and phrases with the magnetic letters. Um, so everywhere we looked, we would have these letters all over the couch, on the ottoman, his little table, on the floor, and I don't know how familiar you are with autism, but part of autism is, uh, is um, some children have um, 
something they call echolalia. And echolalia is where they often will um, use scripted snippets of language that they pick up from a movie or a commercial or anything that attracts their interest. And our son was very interested in credits at the end of movies and also uh, the public broadcasting system sponsor thank yous. So we would, I would come in the kitchen and on the floor, um, it would, he would have the whole introduction to a video or something. Parents, please, you know, read with your child to explain this and that, you know, whatever it was, whatever the commercial was, he would put that whole paragraph in magnetic letters. Um, wow. You must've yeah. been seeing, working with a lot of therapists and specialists at that time too, early on. Yeah, we did. We started early intervention when he was 19 months old. And, um, you know, we started kind of slow with that. Um, we had a teacher coming to our home a couple times a month and, and helping us, you know, to, to find better ways to communicate with him and, and solve some of those frustrations that he had. Um, and then he also attended early intervention classes. Um, we did occupational therapy one-on-one -on -one for about four years. Um, we did um, speech therapy um, and, you know, lots of things like that. We also did play therapy and we did some ABA in the home. But with the ABA, it was a very parent-driven program. And we did execute it a lot different from a lot of the traditionally known ABA, we, we did not necessarily want to work to extinguish autistic behaviors. We felt that that was tied in with his um, self-esteem. So we wanted to, to more teach the appropriateness of timing that sometimes, you know, you can just let loose and other times you want to try to, you know, um, work within the, the given social scenario for successful communication and you know so we were very um overbearing with the aba team in that aspect well, it sounds like you had to be uh, become an expert yourself pretty rapidly i would imagine we were really involved um i know when he was born um i i had thought as he got older i would return back to you know I, i'd had lots of jobs as a marketing director in corporate uh, in the corporate world, and I always planned on going back to that. I never planned on not returning to that, but um, we felt that that early window of development was so critical that I did not return to work, and uh, it allowed me to focus 40 to 60 hours of time on what he needed, and, you know, in those in-between moments, that's where I would start. I started with freelance work independently, and there's between minutes, you know, when he was in speech therapy, I was on my laptop writing an article or whatever I could do. Um, and that's really kind of where our company was born. Hmm. Uh, the necessity of changing our schedule to suit what we needed to do for him. Um, so that worked out really, really well for us. Now how much uh, younger is he than the older brothers? Uh, he's about, um, let's see, about 10 years younger than our middle son, Nick, uh, Nick's, Nick's in his early 20s, and um, CJ is probably 13 or 14 years older than him. Um, so there, there was, uh, um, my husband and I joke, because he, he, thought, he thought he was done, but we weren't done. It was a lot of adjustments, which is why we joke about our Just Add Water family. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was bumpy in the beginning, as any blended family can be, but, uh, you know, it, um, it's been really wonderful to see his brothers grow to love him and support him so much. And I think all of us have really grown through that journey. Um, what was it like when school started? Did he, uh, get into well, kindergarten in first grade right away? Well, Wyatt actually had, he's, he's been going to school since he was three. Um, after the early intervention program, he went through the uh, they had a special preschool program for autism, and so he attended that um, before kindergarten for, I guess, two years, and then he transitioned at the same school from that program to kindergarten. Um, after kindergarten, he was actually able to begin mainstreaming about 60% mm, of the time, 
And by the time he got to second grade, he was mainstreaming 90% of the time with, with his peers. So um, we've had a lot of wonderful successes with Wyatt as he's grown and developed skills, you know, over the years. Um, he is, he's a pretty, he's a pretty happy story. Well, that's good to hear. I, when we talked earlier, I think you told me that he also had a diagnosis of hyperlexia. Yes, that's more recent. So that is something that we didn't know about. And I had never heard about until last, uh, probably like last July and uh, June and July, we were actually involved in um, a dispute with our school district. And um, in my research with our attorney, um, I, I came across hyperlexia. Um, just, just we were looking for some different uh, reading specialist experts to assist us. I I had never heard of hyperlexia. I came across the term and something, something made me dig deeper into it. And as I started reading, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is my son. He does all of this and he did it from the time he was a baby. And how would you define it for somebody who isn't, I mean, we all know dyslexia is the inability to read. It used to, criteria used to mean that there was a gap between comprehension was high and decoding or just the reading skills were low. They've kind of taken away the gap in diagnoses now and just the decoding being low can qualify you as being dyslexic. So, What's hyperlexia? Hyperlexia is um, it's almost an opposite to dyslexia. You, the, the child is able to decode anything and they understand the phonetics required to read almost anything, in fact, but they are missing the comprehension the, the deeper language meaning to what they are reading. So um, a child with hyperlexia often presents with um, a, a very strong obsession and love for letters and language in, in general, just the, the patterning of it. And they are often very interested in pursuing their interests deeply. For example, when Wyatt was very young, um, a, a preschooler and up through kindergarten, he, he wanted to learn languages you know, foreign languages. He was fascinated with the periodic table of elements and maps and naming capitals and states. And he's very talented at um, capturing and maintaining just, you know, raw facts on a number of subjects. And that's really where his comfort is in a lot of ways. Um, he still does that today. Um, a lot of, you know, he, he can count um, in Spanish and French and Arabic and Uh, Japanese and Hmong, it, it's just an interest he has. He could do the alphabet backwards, you know, very quickly, um, things like that. So with our son, we knew that he loved letters. He would take letters to bed at night when he was very little, like a child would take a teddy bear or a favorite lovey, you know, but he, I'm taking the vowels to bed tonight, you know, and he would take the vowels, A-E-I-O-U, and sleep with them. Sometimes why? Yeah, sometimes why. <laughs> um, and he would, he would uh, label things in the house with his letters. So if our dog was sleeping on the couch, he would put D-O-G on top of her. <laughs> he would do that on my desk, too. He, he would, um, one time he put cookie on my desk, you know, while I was working because he wanted a cookie, you know. <laughs> so we, we really didn't notice his comprehension challenges as much. Uh, until about second grade, because all of the the introduction to reading is pretty basic, based on sight words and phonetic awareness, you know, and sounding it out. It's not as much focused on the actual comprehension of what is happening in the story, you know, in kindergarten and first grade. All right, it's like the old canard about learning to read, and then at third or second grade, it switches over to reading to learn. Right, big shift for a lot of kids. Right. So when that shift occurred for Wyatt, that's really where his gap became very visible. And that's really kind of where we started um, trying to work with the school district to, you know, how can we improve his comprehension? How do we improve his reading goals on his IEP so that he can succeed and not fall more behind? But unfortunately, um, he continued to remain behind um, for the next several school years. You know, so by the time he got to um, fifth grade, his comprehension level was at 2.5, you know, second grade level. But his his decoding was collegiate level. 
And it was really hard for him. Um, he had self-esteem issues and challenges and frustration as he went through this because um, at, at one time he felt like he was uh, a confident superstar. And now he was seeing more of some of the differences among him and his peers and feeling lost. Um, I think the biggest thing with hyperlexia is that it's not just a reading disorder at its root. It's a language disorder. So um, when you approach hyperlexia to uh, specifically for a reading challenge, there are lots of unique strategies to hyperlexia that you use to scaffold uh, the gap that the student has using their special interests and their unique obsession interests to motivate them and to help teach them. So, you know, our son had this ability to to read things without understanding all of the details. And you, you kind of, he learned through his own patterning system. And if I had a window into how that happens, I would love to use that to help him learn even more, more things. But really, I think that the, the best answer is to Im improve that deficit and strengthen the comprehension. So with Wyatt, he had a tremendous symbolic understanding of a myriad of things. And he had a tremendous uh, decoding skill. But the comprehension uh, was what was really missing. Um, How did you find Linda Mood Bell? Um, I actually knew about Linda Mood Bell <clears throat> from research back when he was in second grade and started struggling. I bought the, the verbalizing or visualizing and verbalizing curriculum book back then and I read it and at that time when I would sit down with some of his teachers I you know was like you know I, I really think that some of this is where his challenge is is that he is not creating that movie in his mind to retain the information and really understand it and I think that that was a really important piece for him and as I started you know we would we play these games I, I call it the imagination game uh, you know he would have a worksheet for school and it might be just something really simple, like um, it would give a two sentence story about, you know, two stallions were in a field uh, during a sunset and, you know, they were eating hay and, and happy. And then it would ask a question like, you know, um, uh, the black stallion gallops away, uh, dot, dot, dot. And he would have to finish what happened, you know, make up something. And he couldn't do it. He really had no concept how to imagine that in his mind. Um, so I really felt that this program would be exactly what he needed. And the school does use that program, but they use it in a group setting. They often use it in um, kind of a independent work process. Really don't feel provides the benefit, the full benefit of the program. Uh, they kind of use bits and pieces. So I discovered it then. And for years I did, I did beg uh, for the school to, you know, can we try this with him? Can we try it more intensively? Um, but, but it just, it just wasn't happening. And you don't live near really, I mean, a couple hours away from a, a closest center. Yeah. Yeah. I think our closest one is San Luis Obispo. I know when I was looking for experts in hyperlexia, uh, I couldn't find a single one in Fresno. And when I discussed it, when I discovered this information, uh, for our son, we actually reached out to a speech and language pathologist in Los Angeles uh, who did um, review all of his, um, you know, school files and his IEP and, you know, all the testing and everything that we had done. And she agreed that he indeed is hyperlexic as well as autistic. Um, so I was really surprised that I could not find anybody local with any knowledge. And when I did bring it up with our school, none of them even knew what I was talking about. Um, so we worked with this speech and language pathologist in Los Angeles to uh, kind of do some tweaking to his IEP goals and accommodations that, that would provide that support and help for him. And so when you made the call to Linda Moon Bell, did, how, how did that go exactly? Did, okay. did you call San Luis Obispo or was it somewhere else? Uh, we, did, we did work through San Luis Obispo. So, because that was our closest, and um, so we were able to do everything remotely, which really worked out well for us because we obviously couldn't drive back and forth every day from Fresno to to there. 
Maybe you can explain how that works because that's a real hot topic right now with everybody yeah. since schools have had to get through a semester basically of that and some are starting, sure. some aren't. And how, how did that work? We were really pleased with the way the, the virtual um, learning worked in this context. Um, they, they sent us a box. The box had earphones, a microphone. It had all the information we needed, and it had a document camera, as well as the, the colored felts and the, the little gemstones and all those different things they use in innovation. Um, so it was very easy to set up. And um, I have to say that uh, I've never seen... I've never seen online instruction be so engaging as it was with the teachers uh, from that we had, at least for Wyatt, because um, they, they made it truly fun. Um, he would sign on and, you know, they were having a, a silk costume day or it was crazy hat day or they had all kinds of different themes that they would use that would get the children excited and make it more fun. Um, additionally, I mean, I took some notes for my own professional career even watching the face that they would interact, um, give me a high five, you know, stuff like that, just to keep the children interested. And with Wyatt, um, he's very interested and feels special if he kind of gets a secret glimpse into the HQ of a corporation of any kind. So with him, they would motivate him uh, by saying, oh, I'll, I will show you our hallway. I'll show you the break room. So simple things like that were what motivated him more than anything. And how many hours per day was he doing the, uh, the program? Yeah. yeah, so we did four hours a day, five days a week for eight weeks. Um, and then after that, we reevaluated and we did another round of four weeks, two hours a day. So we had to juggle school in addition to uh, bringing this in. So um, that was what worked best for our family. And they were open to that. How did it work for him? Was he uh, able to be motivated? And certainly there were some ups and downs over the course of it. Uh, was he able to stay engaged? Yeah, he was able to stay engaged. And he also understood, um, you know, with his restrictions that he, you know, and under he understands that this is a challenge area for him. And it's an area that he wanted to improve in also. So he was invested in it. To it. I felt it was important to share the reasons why with him, you know, so that made a big difference, him being a part of that process and the decision to do this. He knew that it was a commitment and that he was sacrificing some free time to do it. Um, he did pretty well. I knew in the beginning we did struggle a little bit trying to balance school and homework with this because, you know, the, the school did not reduce the homework load. And I, I don't know how many families you know, but schools and homework in the upper grade levels, fifth and sixth grade, it gets pretty intense now. Um, so there were some challenges there and we had to work with our team at school to reduce and get extensions for some assignments because it really wasn't fair to him to come home from school have a 30 minute break and dive into four hours of intensive instruction only to have to do three hours of homework after that, you know, so that, that was tough. But if you work with your school and you, you know, the teachers, a lot of them, they do also agree that this is an important thing to do for the child. And we were able to, to make some changes that helped offset that a little bit. So what were the, the results when he left Linden Rebell? I'm sure you did the assessment. We have the battery of a whole variety yeah. of things. Did you do that online as well? Yes, we did. Yeah. We did. Um, and um, let's see. So we did, he was at 2.5 grade level comprehension in the beginning. And um, currently he is at sixth grade level comprehension um, at the paragraph by paragraph level. He still struggles with a whole page or a multiple page piece of content. So we continue to work on that at home and we're getting pretty creative with ways to do it because he, he does often say, don't lend a me, but me, mom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we have to get pretty creative about how to kind of work that sensory language into our life on a regular basis and to do things that feel like a game but we're actually practicing that visualizing and verbalizing just in a different way. 
Um, for example, we are uh, we're working on D and D Dungeons and Dragons and doing adventures, but we're applying visualizing and verbalizing strategies to that. Um, so that's kind of just a, a fun thing that I'm adapting to try to have him be cooperative and willing to work with me as we move forward. Great. And so he he's at the sixth grade level and he's going into this will be a seventh grade or eighth grade year. Yes, he's going into seventh grade. And seventh. I, I'm super happy with the progress he had, because honestly, to have gone into seventh grade with a, a second grade comprehension level would have been very hard. So I'm glad that he was able in, in this time for the, you know, the past um, six months that we were able to do this. And he's going to be uh, much better off now in the seventh grade than he would have been. Well, it's, it's good that you started the uh, dramatically decrease the gap. That's that's really important because you get into secondary school and things flatten out and you get less, typically less uh, support school-wise. How would you describe the, the visualizing and verbalizing program, what it tries to accomplish? Some children will have to be taught how to create that movie in their mind when they read. And for me, that came natural as a child. I, I was an early reader too. I was reading it too. And reading was one of my favorite escapes as a child. We had our struggles growing up, but, you know, my mom and I, every Friday, we could go to the library and check books out and I could escape into millions of subjects all the time. And it was free. So it, it's a magic thing to me. And I feel that every child should experience that magic with reading. And, you know, I think with any special need, whether it's autism or, or anything else that, you know, there are lots of skills that we have to intentionally teach our children, you know, anything from, you know, how to communicate and have a conversation to um, understanding social skills, understanding, um, you know, propositions, you know, lots of things like that. This is really no different. And I think that I, I wish that more schools would, you know, screen for visualization in that second grade level and, and up because I think that I really think that this is a program that almost any child with autism could benefit from because comprehension in reading is a challenge for a lot of children with autism. So I feel that this program, um, it, it provides a pathway for creating and teaching a child the, the reason why it's important to have that mental movie happening and I think it also helps to strengthen their communication. I mean, that was um, that was a benefit that I didn't really anticipate going into this. But my son is better able to communicate. He has better conversations. He understands language better than he did before we started. And he's better able to express himself uh, rather than just, um, you know, when he can't find the words to explain something, now he can gesture to try to still get that point across. Mm. And that was a huge victory for him because, you know, it, it, it just really, it really opened up a different world for him. Mm. That's great. Well, it's been my experience that this program can be incredibly life-changing when you're able to help people that are, you know, a lot of times we've had adults, uh, some with brain injuries, some that are not on the spectrum, but just struggling with comprehension. And when you're able to unlock the world of understanding for them, uh, it, it really can change everything about their existence. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I think that, that also makes me think of a good point. You know, I, I, um, I was very pleased that uh, Linda Mead Bell, uh, that the center was so open and willing to working with my son, um, even, even with some of the challenges that come with autism, because not every not every learning program out there is so open to that, you know. And we have a very centralized instruction department, and so when blips come up all over the the world at this point, where we see somebody or something that's different, there's a lot of resources internally to to make sure that that's addressed and addressed consistently. Yeah. So it's um, kind of a, like an internal database and knowledge that we have that's pretty pretty extensive. Yeah. A lot of different people. I know our team was excellent at communicating with me um, and, and adapting um, to a quick change if needed in, in their delivery of the instruction. 
Uh, for example, I know my, my son, my son has a hard time when uh, he wants to get 100% on every test. He wants an A plus on every paper and he gets very upset if he comes in below that. Even a 98%, you know, he will be upset to the point that his teachers at school would often put post-it notes over his test scores before they sent the, the schoolwork back home so that he would not see that and kind of have a, a little mini meltdown over that because he's very, he's very harsh on himself. I wish he wasn't, but it's just a thing with him. And so when he, um, you know, when he was doing, working with an instructor and uh, if he didn't get something correct, you know, it, it could be a, a a bigger behavioral trigger for some challenging behaviors in that moment. And so it was as easy as making a phone call to our manager and making a suggestion and they would change it before, you know, they would pause the session and, and make that change. And that was fantastic. Uh, how, as his motivations changed from different subjects, um, they would pivot that motivation. So it's good to hear. And so are you looking forward to this uh, upcoming school year? It's got to be starting in a few weeks, I would imagine. I am. I'm a little nervous. There's so much up in the air. And um, Is I your know, district online? Our district is online right now, but we also have not received any updates that give us a clear picture of the schedule or what it's going to look like. And we actually are due to start on the 17th. So... Hmm. You know, we're kind of, we're still waiting. We've, we've seen things that have been uh, shared generally from the district, but we haven't seen anything specific to our son, his class schedule, or any information like that. So um, I'm, I'm quite nervous about it, but um, why it did, he did enjoy uh, Zooming with his classmates um, at the beginning of the shutdown. And um, I know he looked forward to that connection and, we were very lucky in that his sixth grade teacher, um, he really cared and he went above and beyond. He was available to the students Monday through Friday, two times a day um, since the beginning. And he really felt that it was important that the students stayed in touch with him. And I mean, he did everything from teach things to just listen to the children and offer encouragement. And um, sometimes he was a school counselor and, and a, you know, if a, if a student expressed that they were upset or sad about the way things are, you know, so we were lucky in that we had that communication because that teacher went above and beyond, you know. Great teachers can make incredible difference. That's good to hear. Hyperlexia is a learning disability that many people have never heard of. And, uh, you know, I'm part of a Facebook group uh, for parents um, that is focused on hyperlexia. And I got to say, it's been amazing to connect with parents that have the same, some of the same stories that I do. And if I could go back in time, I, I wish I would have known about this when he was two, because I could have been building some of those comprehension bridges early if I knew, you know, back then. But it's not something that's very, popular. it's not even really a standalone diagnosis today. Right. Yeah, it's, it's got a high comorbidity with uh, with being on the spectrum for sure. Yeah. You know, we've known about it for quite a while. And, you know, one of the sadder things are, are kids that are maybe not, the gap isn't high enough to qualify for hyperlexia per se, but just having a low comprehension because they get, you know, not people don't know what to do. They think they're not trying hard enough. They think they're not smart. And that just kind of becomes a, a blanket where, oh, you know, we don't expect much from them. And it's, it's unfortunate. So... Uh, we always feel very passionately about being able to hopefully unlock the potential for uh, people through that, that uh, ability to image. Yeah, I know learning about that made a big difference in a lot of the accommodations that we fought to gain for him at school. Uh, for example, you know, presenting things to him in written language rather than verbal only or picture only, mm -hmm. graphic. Um, you know, there were... He, he has some legitimate frustrations that stem from that misfire that can happen when it's verbal only um, or, you know, when a teacher is doing whole class instruction and speaking to the whole class and he's required to take notes 
you know, that's an area that, that he struggled. So understanding hyperlexia and what that means for him really helped us to um, obtain an, a, um, a technology assessment for him and to add a lot of accommodations that are specific to his needs that will help to reduce that. And being able to go into some grade at sixth grade comprehension is going to really make a big difference, I think, too. That's great. Thank you so much for talking with me today, sharing your story, Wyatt's story, and wish him the best this year. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Visit our website, lindaboodbell.com, and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and now Instagram TV to see more inspiring stories. We are Linda Mood Bell.